Although Enoch is not part of the biblical canon, it was nevertheless a very well-known and influential book, both before and during the life of Jesus. Interestingly, part of Enoch's prophecy actually did make its way into the New Testament in the book of Jude. The prophecy begins, The words of the blessing with which Enoch blessed the righteous chosen who will be present on the day of tribulation to remove all the enemies and the righteous will be saved. And he took up his discourse and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, who had the vision of the Holy One and of heaven, which he showed me. From the words of the watchers and holy ones I heard everything, and as I heard everything from them, I also understood what I saw. Not for this generation do I expound, but concerning one that is distant, I speak, and concerning the chosen, I speak now, and concerning them, I take up my discourse. 1 Enoch 1 1 3. The oracle begins in very similar fashion to the blessing of Moses, rather than the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel, Deuteronomy 33-1. We have here the blessing with which Enoch blessed the righteous chosen who will be present on the day of tribulation. The vision, according to the author, was given during a visit to heaven and also imparted through hearing the words of the watchers and holy ones while there. Enoch makes the context of his prophecy clear. It is for a distant generation, specifically those who will be alive during the Great Tribulation, to witness the coming of God from heaven. Then the prophecy begins, The Great Holy One will come forth from His dwelling, and the Eternal God will tread from thence upon Mount Sinai. He will appear with His army, He will appear with His mighty host from the heaven of heavens. All the watchers will fear and quake, and those who are hiding in all the ends of the earth will sing. All the ends of the earth will be shaken, and trembling and great fear will seize them unto the ends of the earth. The high mountains will be shaken and fall and break apart, and the high hills will be made low and melt like wax before the fire. The earth will be wholly rent asunder, and everything on the earth will perish, and there will be judgment on all. With the righteous he will make peace, and over the chosen there will be protection, and upon them will be mercy. They will all be gods, and he will grant them his good pleasure. He will bless them all, and he will help them all. Light will shine upon them, and he will make peace with them. Behold, he comes with the myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, and to destroy all the wicked and to convict all flesh for all the wicked deeds that they have done, and the proud and hard words that wicked sinners spoke against him. Verse Enoch 119 The initial comments concerning God, coming from his place of dwelling in heaven and landing on Mount Sinai, are fascinating, whereas Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, and Habakkuk 3 all envision God coming from Sinai and marching toward Jerusalem, some translations of Enoch's prophecy seem to portray him overtly landing directly on Mount Sinai. The underlying Greek of Enoch includes the words upon the earth, which make Enoch's exact meaning difficult to ascertain. Does the prophecy indicate that God will come directly from heaven to Sinai or that he will descend from heaven to the earth, eventually coming to Sinai? This immediately stirs up questions regarding Zechariah 14, which many wrongly remember as stating that he will land on the Mount of Olives. However, the actual statement there is simply that, in that day, meaning within the larger time period being referenced, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. This will not happen, of course, until after he comes to Jerusalem with myriads of his holy ones, as the consensus of other texts indicates. We will discuss this matter in more detail as we move forward. The emphasis of Enoch's prophecy concerns judgment against the wicked. As Nicholsburg comments, 
This initial section of Enoch's oracle describes the coming of the transcendent God, the divine warrior who will appear on earth to execute universal judgment on humanity and the rebel watchers. The prophecy seems to conflate Deuteronomy 33 with Micah 134, whereas the blessing of Moses envisions God coming from Sinai, Micah envisions God coming down from heaven. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be split, like wax before the fire, like water poured down a steep place. Micah 1, 3, 4. Enoch employs language similar to Micah of the mountains melting like wax. This also calls to mind the words of David at the outset of Psalm 68, which calls on God to arise and judge his enemies, who will melt like wax. The poetry here is intended to convey God's judgment against the nations and the wicked throughout the earth. In the face of his presence and judgments, they will dissipate like wax before a raging fire. James H. Charlesworth summarizes the prophecy this way, Israel shall be saved from among the Gentiles, and the Messiah shall appear to them and bring them up to Jerusalem with great joy. Moreover, the kingdom of Israel, gathered from the four quarters of the world, shall eat with the Messiah, and the Gentiles shall eat with them. What is so fascinating about this prophecy is the fact that the final portion is cited verbatim by Jude in the New Testament, Jude 14. Jude and others in the early church interpreted this prophecy as referring to the return of Jesus. So Jude cites the prophecy of Enoch, which describes God descending from heaven to Mount Sinai and applies it to the return of Jesus. While the concept of Jesus marching through the desert when he returns is, no doubt, a foreign concept to most Christians today, G.K. Beale argues it actually would have been widely known during the first century. During this period, according to Beale, besides Enoch, various other Jewish writings developed the belief that the Messiah would gather his people in the wilderness at the end time. Further, this view of the future is reflected in the writings of Josephus, who explicitly identifies first-century messianic movements with desert and exodus themes. For example, Josephus makes mention of various false messiah figures who led groups out into the desert, pretending that God would there show them the signals of liberty. One such false prophet, we're told, got together 30,000 men that were deluded by him. These he led round about from the wilderness to the mount, which was called the Mount of Olives, and was ready to break into Jerusalem by force from that place. And if he could but once conquer the Roman garrison and the people, he intended to dominate over them by the assistance of those guards of his that were to break into the city with him. As N.T. Wright correctly comments, anyone collecting people in the Jordan wilderness was symbolically saying, this is the new exodus. Beale adds, the association with the wilderness of the zealots and similar movements is probably part of this larger messianic expectation. According to Beale, the Qumran community specifically moved out into the desert, believing that they were beginning to fulfill these prophecies of restoration there. While the author of One Enoch and those from the Qumran community, various Jewish zealots, and John the Baptist likely had drastically different beliefs. They shared the common view that the messianic restoration would take place out in the desert. Based on all of the various prophecies that we have studied, the general storyline of the desert prophecies had obviously become a widely held view. This is likely why Jesus actually warned his followers not to go out into the desert seeking every new messianic figure who came along. Matthew 24, 24, 26. The Bible teaches that when Jesus returns, he will march through the desert 
delivering the remnant of his people from captivity and leading them safely back to Zion. Together, the desert prophecies provide us with the most detailed, vibrant, glorious descriptions of Jesus' return in the whole Bible. These prophecies also provide us with the foundation for the New Testament vision of Jesus' second coming. Strangely, it is a picture that very few Christians have ever seen or heard. Deuteronomy 33, as speaking of the return of Jesus, is because it is the foundational passage for a larger family of Old Testament texts that are also interpreted by the New Testament as speaking of the return of Jesus. Together, these passages all portray the same general picture, that of Yehvah as a man, coming from Mount Sinai, marching through the desert of Edom toward the Promised Land to save his people Israel. Scholars have long noted the similarities of these various passages and, occasionally, their connection to the return of Jesus. The desert prophecies include the blessing of Moses, Deuteronomy 33, the song of Deborah, Judges 5, David's great processional psalm, Pest 68, Isaiah's highway in the desert prophecies, Isaiah 35, 40, 42, 63, the prayer of Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3, the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 14, the extra-biblical prophecy of Enoch 1, Enoch 1. He will come shining forth like the radiance of the sun. His coming will be glaringly and unavoidably obvious. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 27 In conclusion, the narrative that we've examined throughout was widely known and believed by the Jews of the first century. Jesus, John the Baptist, and the Apostles all would have been very familiar, in varying degrees, with this beautiful story of restoration. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, like this video, and leave a comment below letting me know your thoughts. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on new content and updates from my channel. Thanks again for your support, and I'll see you in the next video.